Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, the name above all names, the name that we proclaim, Lord God, the name that's uh, the name that we want, we are um, representing here, Lord God. While we're here in this in this world on this earth, Lord God, help us to be better representatives, Lord God. Help us to be ambassadors for for your name. And of everything we say and everything we do, Lord God, help us to live the word, Lord. Help us tonight, Lord God, by filling us with your spirit and, and teaching us tonight, Lord God, through your word, so that we may um, endure difficult times, so that we have wisdom for difficult times, Lord God, and so we, that we would endure till the end, Lord. We need your word, we need your spirit, we need you, Lord God. So be with us today, Lord God, and, and bless this study in Jesus' name, amen. So like I said before, we're in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. We finish this, um, this letter, this letter of James on Monday with the men's group. So we had went over that for the last few months, I guess, and in the men, ah, pretty much all summer, I think, we went through James. Yeah, I think it was a little bit longer even, longer than the summer. It was pretty much. We just finished it, and it was awesome. It was a blessing with the men that were here and, and got to sharpen each other. It's fun. Men's Bible study is fun. Not for the faint of heart. There's some sparks always. Every, every men's study, there's always some sharpening, some iron sharpening iron, and, and, and it's, uh, it's good. Yeah, it's good. So we learn from one another, grow from one another, and it's awesome. So it really, like, I had read James before, but going through it with, with, with the men here at Devor. It really was really a blessing. It really was. It, it, it made me really appreciate this letter more, more than ever, going through it with the men. And um, it just spoke to me so much throughout it. And it's just so, um, of course, when we, read, when we read the word, we have to know who, you know, who they're talking to and, and who their audience is. But it applies, and it's so relevant to us and to our, our day-to-day. And even this chapter right here, talking about the last days, it was the last days then, and it's the last days now. And it's getting closer than it ever was before. So it's so, so just reading it, you're just like, wow, it's, it's, it's what's going on in my life. Things that I need to avoid. Um, my faith that I got to work out. Times that I need to repent. Times that I need to pray. It's just so, so practical. So many good nuggets in here in, in this letter. So um, like I said, it's James. That's the, the half-brother of Jesus. We learn that from, from the rest of the Gospels, that it's the half-brother of Jesus. If you guys remember in some of the Gospels, that Jesus' family, including James, rejected him. They didn't believe him. They thought he was, he was mad. They thought he was crazy at one point. So that's pretty interesting to me that here he is. He's also um, a leader at the time of, of the Jerusalem church, according to um, Galatians, I believe, in Maybe Acts as well. Yeah, Acts as well. We get that. So he was a leader. He was like a bishop of the, of the Jerusalem church. Um, he had a lot of sway. He was in leadership. And he started off really bad, like we were speaking about earlier, about some of us, how we started out our walk. The first, the first couple years for me, like, boy, I was making all sorts of mistakes. I was just falling down and getting up and falling down and just beating myself up. And the Lord was there, and he was there to, to, to wash me clean and, and, and to discipline me and to, to show me how to do better through his word. The only one thing I'm grateful for. So James had a rough start, but here we see him writing this letter, this awesome, powerful letter, and he also being a, a leader of the Jerusalem church. We know from the beginning of this letter in chapter 1 that he's writing to a mostly Jewish Christian audience, and right there in chapter 1, I'll just go there real quick, first couple of verses in chapter 1. We are going to go over chapter 5. But in chapter 1, it says, James, a bondservant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. In verse 2, he says, consider, consider it all joy, my brethren. And then he goes on from there. So we know that this book is a letter written to Christians, Jewish Christians predominantly at that time but Christians nonetheless, the church. So that taken into mind, when we read James throughout there, throughout it, he refers to brethren, my brethren, because there's a debate 
in a lot of um, scholarly debate, who was he speaking to? Like, was it was it the unbelieving Jews? Was it the the the, the Jewish aristocrat, uh, aristocracy? Was it was it unbelievers? And as if like he 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 digresses and goes. Now he's just now this part's just for the unbelievers. This part's for the believers. Well, he was talking to a church, and it's compiled of all different people. And as Jesus, when he taught and he preached into the crowds, there was all, all sorts of people out there that were listening. He had his disciples. He had as the Jews. He had the Jewish elite out there, the Pharisees listening. He had a lot of people listening. And 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 when a, a preacher's preaching, when a teacher's teaching, he has to know who his audience is as well. It's made up of all sorts of different people. So he it's a general, it's a general letter to the church. It's not specifically to one church as is a letter into the Corinthians, but it's a letter to the church, as it says here, 12 tribes that are dispersed throughout Judea. So this was for them. This was for the church. So keep that in mind when you're reading the, the, the letter the letter of James, that, that it is a general letter. Um, it's written like an essay, which is awesome because for me, I can lose track. But an essay, when things are in an essay form, you kind of can keep, keep going. He repeats a lot of things, and he, makes his, he stresses his point, makes his point really well. You know, it's broken up. In the original, there wasn't chapter divisions, but it's written so well that you could follow along so, so easily. So it's, a, it's considered a, like a letter essay. Um, and he writes it to the, the Christian audience to show them how to live out their Christian faith, how to live out their Christian faith. So, so it's really, really practical, but really rich. And it's basically teaching us how to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And that's what James' concern was here for these Jewish Christians that were going through, some were going through rough times, as we are today, and that's why it's so relevant, because that's just the way it's always been for Christians, going through rough times, but it's increasing, and it will increase, so this is completely relevant, and as we're going to see in chapter 5, super relevant for the last days, so much in their uh, eschatology in there in, in chapter 5. Um, in chapter two, in chapter 1, James teaches about the testing of our faith, how it gives us endurance, that our faith is tested. Um, also in chapter 1, he talks about how we should pray for wisdom to get through difficult times. So then the trial is the testing of our faith, the trial, the difficult times, how that's good for us. It's for our endurance. Pastor Marco taught how discipline is, is good. That's what's going to build us up. That's what's going to strengthen us. That's what's gonna, it's what's going to give us endurance. So you guys are familiar with a lot of these, these great, these great um, nuggets that are in this, in this letter. Um, you guys know that we're to be doers and not just hearers of the word, as James teaches in chapter 1 as well. So some of the other things he addresses are the sin of favoritism, partiality, you know, favoring, favoring one over the other, um, faith without works. You remember that, the, the scripture that says faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. We know that. The tongue, that's a big one. And that was good for us men to study that, right? to guard our tongues, because I know a lot of you could, <laughs> you wives could agree, we need to guard our tongues, the men. So we got a flippant tongue sometimes. Well, read James. It'll remind you, remind you what to do with that tongue. It'll remind you what to do that, guard that tongue. What, it could set off a, a fire. It could set off fire, that tongue. Life and death in that tongue. Yeah. So um, he says to avoid sensuality and worldly lusts. He teaches us other ways to resist the devil to resist the devil by submitting to God and humbling ourselves before God. He reminds us that we need to draw near to God. That way he will draw near to us. So all these great things that James packs in these five short, short chapters, so much, it's so much. Um, chapter five continues, and it's just so much pearls of wisdom that James puts together. And it's amazing. It's a, an amazing letter letter essay that's written for the church in the last days, as we'll see here in chapter 5. So let's go to chapter 5 here. So chapter 5, I'm going to read the first six verses here. Come now, you rich, weep in hell, for your misery is what you're coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, 
the pay of the laborers who mowed your field and which have been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous. He does not resist you. And we'll stop there. So here we, we see, um, this is pretty, pretty strong words from James here, Jesus' half-brother. He, um, I think that if he was preaching this message here around some of the places that we go minister to, I think he would be told, hey, don't judge. Don't judge, brother. I think that's what he would be told. Hey, you're being too judgmental. Because what he's preaching here is God's judgment. This is God's judgment for those, for the rich, but not just for the rich, the rich that misuse their riches. He's pronouncing judgment over him. It gets real, real strong. Um, if we go to chapter 4, the way chapter 4 started, it's similar to chapter 4. So we'll go there, just right, just right next to your chapter there. It says here. So he kind of repeats this, but in a more harsh way. Because here in chapter 4, it's more of a, of a, I think it's more of a call to repentance. I believe chapter 5 is also the same thing, because those with ears will repent when they hear this. But in chapter 4, it's, the judgment hasn't came down. It is, is hard, I think, that he's pre- preaching there, so, or teaching there. In chapter 4, it says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you, church, he's talking to, is not the source your pleasure that wage war in your members? The pleasures, something. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you didn't ask. You do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. He calls them you adulteresses. You know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So a real strong warning there to the church to not make yourself an enemy of God. We were saved. We were once enemies with God. Let's not make ourselves enemies of God. We were born in sin. We were always in enmity with God. We were always in enmity with God. Here it's saying in chapter 4 not to make yourself an enemy, with, an, an enemy of God in chapter 4. So you can see there it's pretty strong, but he even gets stronger in the next, in the next chapter. I believe he even gets stronger. I'm going to kind of go for, uh, fast forward in chapter 4 as well, just so you could see kind of how it flows into chapter 5, no chapter divisions, where he talks about drawing near to God so that he draws near to you. He had said, submit therefore to God. Remember he said God in, in verse 6, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he's, he's, he's sharing this with the church, like imploring them, like, just remember, you guys, like, God is opposed to the proud. He, he's opposed to the proud, but he gives so much grace to the humble. So submit to God so the devil will flee from you. You know, that's, that's, we like to blame the devil a lot, but a lot of time it's just us and not us being proud and not submitting. And then, of course, the devil's there roaring like a lion, seeking who he can devour and who is he going to devour? He's going to devour the ones that are proud and not submitting to God, not making God their everything. He's going to, those are going to be the easy pickings, the easy prey. So he, he calls on them in chapter 4 to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And the devil will flee. He draws near to you, the devil will flee. He says before that, amen. But then he says, he gets a little harsher and says, Cleanse your hand, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep, he says. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And we're carrying around, you know, laughing and, and mourning, like and laughing and weeping. Meanwhile, if we're, if we're living like there is no God, like lawlessness, and we're laughing and weeping like it's no, like it's no big deal, and we have pride in our heart like that. That we, he's saying, no, 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 cleanse yourself, you sinners, purify your hearts, double-minded. Come to God; He'll draw near, draw near to Him; He'll draw near to you. Mourn, weep. It's like repentance. Well. Going right into chapter 5, he continues that thought. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries, which are coming upon you. Your riches. So, so the warning there was to, was to the church, and this is for those who have gone that far. At the time, there was a Jewish aristocracy that was um, definitely taking advantage, definitely taking advantage of, of the poor. 
They were, um, they were, they were withholding wages, as it says here in James. Um, there was the haves and the have-nots. So that, that's what was going on. So he's saying here, rich. So it's definitely an indictment against them. But the ones that weren't believers, there, there was already, those that don't believe are judged already. So this is a, this is a judgment for, for those that are allowing that to, to go that far. Remember what he said in chapter 4? So these are those that have already gone too far. That judgment is coming. Like judgment is coming, although it doesn't have to come to individuals. Judgment is coming for, for those that, that discount God, for those that, that hold their riches higher than God, who, who, who put their faith in their earthly treasures and not heavenly treasures. Judgment is coming, but there's still a call for repentance to, to individuals. It's still someone who has ears can still hear that and say, hey, that's me. And that's happened. It's happened many times. We have to remember to who his audience was. Remember Jesus when he was, when he was, when he was giving his word out there and when he, and during his ministry. Remember who was listening out there. There were, there were the Jewish peasants out there. There was Jewish poor. But there was also the rich Jews that were out there, the Pharisees that were out there that listened and heard. And then and, and we know that people like Nicodemus came secretly to talk to Jesus and wanted more. They wanted more. And we know, as uh, Pastor Marco reminded us the other day, that in church history, Nicodemus actually gave up everything. He gave up everything to follow Jesus. He laid down his riches, and he, and he followed Jesus. So Jesus had shared with, with all them. So if the church was reading this, or all the churches were reading this right here, there was going to be someone. A lot of times we, um, like I was saying at men's Bible study, how we chop it up, and we sharpen each other, and it gets a lot of spark sometimes. We could have debates sometimes. Oh, he's talking to the world right here. Well, the world's already condemned. This is pro- like pronouncing judgment to those that are already judged. It's kind of, um, it's kind of like when, we're, when, when, when Pastor Mark was giving a sermon and, and you hear something that's really like, oh, good, but it's always like, it's really good for that person right there. I hope they're hearing it, right? <laughs> it's like, so we read this and we're like, yeah, yeah, that's right. The judge, you know, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna be judged. That's right, that's right. But there might be someone in, in the audience that's like, that's me. That's me he's talking about. I'm doing this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be judged. Well, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. There's repentance, and then there's forgiveness. So that's why God gives us all the way up until the very end. He gives us that chance, you know, and we're going to read later in Revelation how he even gave the lukewarm church, Laodicea, a chance to repent. And he's doing the same thing here with this letter that the Spirit wrote through James, and he's calling on all of us the same thing. So Paul, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He says he, he, he gave all that up to follow Jesus. Paul, I'm going to share this real quick. What was it? Peter Waldo. Peter Waldo, I believe it was, of the, Wal, Wal, well, I can't pronounce it ever, Waldensians. Waldensians. He was a, a Christian in the, in, the middle, in the Middle Ages. Remember what, what another name for the Middle Ages were? The Dark Ages. You know, dark. There was no, you know, hearing of the word. The, the word wasn't even allowed to go out. The church... At the time, was it the, was it the Catholic Church, which is outlaw of the word? So it's like, it was really dark. So this is who God raised up during a dark time like that. God raised up a person like, like Peter Waldo. So I'm going to read this real quick. Peter Waldo, he was born a rich merchant in Lyon, France, around 1140. He earned his money by lending to poor French peasants and charging them high interest. He was happy taking their money until one day he heard the, script, the scripture from Mark 10, 17 through 25. I believe that's the rich, the rich young ruler. I went there earlier, and it's the rich young ruler. So he heard that, that parable, and he, and he wasn't there. He wasn't believing then, you know, but he heard it, right? So, and it was read aloud, and he heard it. He was convicted and knew that his love for money had made it impossible for him to love God and his fellow man, and that he will never enter the kingdom. Taking Christ's words to heart, he decided to give away his fortune to the poor, and lived the rest of his life as a poor, wandering preacher. He preferred preaching from the Bible in French because most people couldn't read the Latin Vulgate, and so he decided to translate it, the New Testament, into French. He didn't agree with the Catholic Church specifically about a lot of things, saints, purgatory, transubstantiation, um, and he didn't agree that the, only the priests could teach. Only the priests, you know, the priests um, had the right to teach. He preached on the basing of, of, basis of Scripture, before long, his version of the New Testament got him in trouble with the Pope and the Church of Rome. They labeled him a heretic. 
people and his followers called the Waldensians were heavily persecuted by the Catholic Church for centuries. They were the most hated persecuted Christians during the Middle Ages. And countless of them died in fires believing the Bible and what Peter had taught. The Waldensians were known for their holy, loving memorization of scriptures and preaching the gospel and helping the poor. He didn't write any books, any theological books. He was too busy preaching, memorizing scripture, and helping the poor and escaping persecution. Most of what we know about him is from the Catholic Church who hated him and other, and other enemies. So this is someone who God raised up. This is someone who God raised up through the darkest of ages. This is, to me, it's pretty awesome. Through hearing things like this. So James, brother of Jesus here, is, is, is saying some really powerful words. And like I said, if, if this was preached today, if he was out there preaching at these places, nobody would want to hear that. Nobody would want to hear that. He would definitely be call, called, um, what would he be called? Think of some of the things he would be called. He would definitely say, you're being too harsh. You definitely say, stop judging us. You know, he was a fire and brimstone preacher. That's what he would be called. Um, but this is, this is the half-brother of Jesus who's, who, who, who I believe learned a lot from his, from his brother. So the rich young ruler, speaking of the rich young ruler, remember he had to give up his, give up his, his, precious, his precious sin, which was idolizing money over God. Uh, let's see. I'm going to turn to Matthew 6, 19 through 24 real quick. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up yourselves treasures in he heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can, I'm going to go down, so it says, no one can go serve two masters, for either you hate one or love the other. He will be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. God's always concerned with our heart. So where our, where our treasure is, our heart will be there also. So we have to really, really examine ourselves to ask us, you know, ask ourselves where our heart is. Like, where is our heart? Where does it lie? Treasures of the earth or the treasures in heaven with God. Uh, Luke 12. Luke 12. Luke 12, starting in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, speaking to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. So then he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now you will own what you have prepared. Who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So, That was right. Oh, well, we can fast forward to chapter, uh, verse 29. And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying, for all these things nations of regularly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. Seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock. I love that. For your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. And here he says, sell your possessions, give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which don't wear out and an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief can no near nor moth destroys. No thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your heart is there, for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So this is an indictment against the rich. It's misuse of riches by the rich, obviously. So it's similar to that. I mean, this parallels, in my opinion, James' brother parallels to what Jesus taught. He's teaching what Jesus taught, which is what we all should be doing, right? It's teaching what, what the Jesus taught, what the apostles taught, not our own opinions, not our own, you know, not our, our own way, but teaching what Jesus taught. 
teaching what the word teaches. And that's what we should be doing. So let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 5 here. Mm, start in verse 3, actually. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, as with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. Out of rich arise envy, strife, abuse of language, evil suspicion, and constant frictions between men of depraved mind and deprived deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. gain. Strongly parallels James right there, chapter 4 and chapter 5 right there, what we just had read earlier. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we can't take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and in a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. I believe that the people that he's talking about here are the people that James is talking about in, in chapter 5. And he's talking to those, they wandered away from the faith. I believe they wandered away their riches. Because of their riches, they wandered away from their faith. And he's pronouncing judgment to those who have fallen away. But for those who have ears with here, it's a call of repentance. It's a call of repentance. Just come back, come back. Because even in chapter 5, with someone who has fallen away and going after them. So... Um, I believe that they had wandered away from the truth. I think they, they didn't abide. They didn't continue abiding in God's words and, his, and what he had taught, what he had taught and what Paul had taught. But as we see here, these are the sound words. Those are of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul starts it, that whole little passage that I just read. So how important it is, if it's a different doctrine, if it's not teaching us about godliness, you know, if it's ta- <laughs> teaching something else than that, uh, if it's just for our gain, that godliness, you know, that it's it's wrong. It's it's not it's not sound doctrine. You've got to always know that if if it's coming from the our apostolic teaching, if it's coming from Jesus. Okay, um, Jesus said, "A person is a fool if he stores up his earthly wealth and he's not rich towards God." So first and foremost, right, we have to seek first His kingdom, and um, we'll just go to Revelation three because Jesus, in His mercy, in His infinite mercy, He goes as far as to go to the church of Laodicea, a lukewarm church in Revelation 3. Similar to language about gold rusting in, in Revelation 3, to the letter to, to, to Laodicea. He says here to the angel of the church to, in Laodicea, write, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see just strongly parallels James 5 as well. The oil there. Those whom I love, I reprove. As Pastor Marco was talking about how important discipline is and to receive God's discipline with a humble heart because those are those, are those who God loves. He loves his children. He, he, wants to, he wants to reprove you. He says, therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we'll read in James where he talks about knocking at the, or being at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with him and he with me. And he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also came and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So he even here, we see here, and like I said, that debate over was, well, who are they talking to? A lukewarm? They're not really Christians. Well, they're Christians. They're lukewarm Christians. I believe, I'm 100% convinced that Laodiceans, according to this right here, it says, 
You're neither hot nor cold. It says you have become wealthy. You say now I am rich. This is what they became wealthy. If you read, if you read Colossians, it's Laodicea, and the brethren in Laodicea are included in that. Paul says, give this to the brethren in Laodicea. So the letter to the Colossians applies to, the let, to those that were the brethren that were in Laodicea. And here's 30, and Paul gives them warnings in Colossians as well. Here we are 30 years later in Revelation, and this is written, and Laodicea had become lukewarm. But even in that lukewarm church that Jesus pronounced judgment over, he's going to vomit that lukewarm out of his mouth. He's pronouncing judgment, just like James was in the beginning of chapter 5. There's still a call for repentance. Still what somebody with ears can still overcome, can still overcome and still repent, even out of Laodicea. And like I was saying before, a lot of times we say, well, that's for them. It's not for us. Think about where you guys are at. Think about where we're at right now. We're in America. According to biblical standards, we are the rich. The average American, the average American makes 99% more than the rest of the world, than the rest of the world. That's amazing to me that we're, we're like, like I said, according to biblical standards, we're rich. We are the last day's church, the church of Laodicea. We're comfortable here, and it's good. We've been blessed. Praise the Lord for that. But with that blessing it comes a great responsibility for us to go out there. We have churches open. Let's get to them. We have Bibles, let's read them. We're able to go out into the public and preach the gospel, let's go do it. We're able to work and share with our neighbors and share with our coworkers, let's open our mouths. We've still got so much freedom here, but let's not take that freedom lightly, right? Let's pray, and, if, and, and it's impossible. I mean, so many times I'm in front of people and things are being said, and maybe for the sake of, 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 of an argument or to start something that I can't finish because of the time or whatever the restrictions are, I miss opportunities. And it's like, that's why we need to pray, as James was going to remind us. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray for boldness. Paul prayed for an opening of the door, to open the door for the word when he was in prison. He didn't say, pray that I'd be released out of here. He said, no, pray that the, the door for the word be opened because he wanted to share with the people who, were, who had him there. So that's us. I mean, that's us. That's, that's, if there's any, any church in, in that's present day, it's the church in America. Uh, that can be considered Laodicea. So this is a warning to us. Back to James. So they were, to, they were Laodicea was told to forget their their uh, their riches. Forget that. Forget their riches. Give that stuff up. They need to buy the gold from. They need to buy from Jesus the gold that's refined by fire, right? In the white garments. That's what they need to grab a hold of. The eternal things. And. God may be calling us today to give up something and grab a hold of something else. It's as simple as that. And it, we've got to ask ourselves, what's he calling me? To, what, what does he want me to give up? It might not be everything, but it might be, it's most likely something. He wants us to give up something, you know, and replace it with his eternal treasure. You know, that's the gist of it. In chapter, uh, I'm sorry, back in James 5, as it says there, this is in the last days. The last days then, the last days now. We're getting closer. Eventually, it's going to be the last, the last of days. Um, just with all the things in, that are being um, fulfilled in prophecy right now. Um, like I said on Monday with the men, the believers that have been way believers, way longer than me, and have been watching the times, they see how things are. I mean, for the last 40 years, they're saying, you know, 40 years ago they were going through this. Because a lot of people will say, oh, it's always been like that. This is just the way it's always been. You talk to believers who have been believers for 40 years, 40, 50 years, and they'll tell you it, has, it hasn't always been like this. It's different now because of all the things that are happening in Israel back in the country, and there's so much more other things that have been fulfilled. So it, it's not the same. You know, Jesus is closer than he's ever been. And besides that, we're not promised tomorrow. So for each one of us, he could be that close tomorrow. He can come knocking on the door. Look what we just read about the farmer required of them that night. Verse 4 and 5. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. The fields actually cry out. And all creation moans. It's like when Cain was killed and his blood cried out. 
and which has been withheld by you cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the lords of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a wanton a life of wanton pleasures. You have fanned the heart, your hearts in a day of slaughter. In the day of slaughter. So, similar to repeating what it said in, in chapter in, in chapter four, similar to that about living in wanton pleasures, about lusting on things that we couldn't have. Things like that. This is what was going on here, um, fighting and quarreling. But here there was, obviously, he's writing to people who actually were like indentured servants, I guess, or paid laborers, day laborers. And they, they, they needed their daily wage to feed their families. So it wasn't just paycheck to paycheck. It was like day to day. Like they that they, they needed that to survive for their kids to survive. If they didn't get paid for their day work, day, their day's work, they weren't eating. So they were actually being withheld that by these by these owners and these owners of companies or owners of land that had them work the land and they weren't paying them. They were and I believe that 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 could happen. Uh, I believe that could happen to any of us. Um, we've had contractors here. I'm not going to call anybody by name, but Brother Roy can tell you. We've had contractors here who are Christian companies have came in and done work for us and have left us high and dry, have gave us a quote, came back you know, a week later and tripled the quote. And these are, these are Christians. You could say, well, they're not real Christians. I don't know. I don't know that. God knows that. But these are Christians. And, and it's important for us to, to, to live a life as Christians with integrity, with integrity and in, in, in all of our business dealings, everything that we do, especially as it says here in these days. It says here, um, oh, I'm not there yet, but so especially that. He says here that they withheld the labor. So we have to just, he's going to get into the whole, the whole yes, let your yes be no and your, and your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, it's just talking about our Christian virtue, our Christian integrity. Like, we need to be men of honor. And, and this is James. They called him James the Just. We'll get into that in a little bit. But James the Righteous, he was known for his righteousness. And don't, don't we want to be known for our righteousness? We want to be known for our righteousness. Even if all these things are going on and people are scrambling to make ends meet and, and people are stealing from each other because that's what's going to happen, is what's, what does happen now. We can't participate in that. While well, he got me, I'm going to get him before he gets me. And it's like things are getting so tight. Um, there's, 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 there's food shortages. Um, the, the, the banks have frozen up and I can't get in there and to get my money, you know, which is probably going to happen. Things like that. Um, what desperate times call for desperate measures? Well, for the Christian, it calls for more prayer, for more trusting in the Lord to provide. He, he, he's letting them know here, those people of that time, don't take the law into your own hand because that's what a lot of the zealots in those times were doing. They were trying to overthrow the, the Jewish aristocracy. They were trying to overthrow Rome, who the, the Jewish aristocracy, er, I can always mess up that word, the Jewish wealthy people, they um, submitted to. They were in bed with. So don't, don't, don't go there because Christians will go there. Imagine being there and being a Christian and, and, and being a, a Jewish Christian and you have your, your neighbor, your buddy, your friend who's now a zealot. He's like, come on, we're going to go and, you know, we're going to go and steal from these, this, this little uh, Roman cohort over here. We're going to go overturn it because we're not, we, they're withholding our wages. I can't feed my family, so I'm going to go rob them. And, you know, they're trying to get him and, and do these things. It's okay because it's like today you think of Robin Hood. It's okay. You're robbing from the rich to give to the poor. Thou shalt not steal. Plain and simple. So it's like. No, we can't start going into that. And this is who he was talking to. So I can imagine them reading this be like, oh, they could have been thinking at the time, like, man, I was re- going to resort to that because I can't feed my family. What kind of um, shysty things was I going to resort to to feed my family? You know, breaking the law, you know, getting over on somebody. Um, no, we need to trust the Lord. The Lord, we just pronounce judgment on them. That's going to happen. It's a judgment. It's set for them, for those who, don't, who won't repent. Uh, so in verse 5 there, you have lived a luxurious life. It says that you have, you have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter, like when, the, like when a, a, an animal is fattened to be slaughtered and to be eaten. 
and they'd eat, they'd eat that thing, right? It's fanned. It reminds me of, of um, someone else who was slaughtered. Who else was slaughtered that we read about in Isaiah? To our Lord, right? He was oppressed and he was afflicted in, in, 50, in Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. It's interesting, that's what happened to him, like a little lamb that was led to the slaughter. And here we see the rich are going to be judged like that. The ones who wanted to live a luxurious life without acknowledging God or just forgetting about God even, he says you're condemned and put to death. For that, With that same, God deals with people like that all throughout the Old Testament. Um, even in the New Testament, God sins of people, God, it, it, it finds them. Sin will find them, and God deals with them with the same way that they were dealing with others. I think it says that in Revelation as well. Um, when when, the, in, when the, the nations are going to torment the people, God's going to deal with the nations in the same way, and he's gonna, his wrath is going to be on them the same way they dealt with his church, in the same way. And here we see them, they're going to get dealt with in the same way that our Lord was dealt with, I believe. And it says here in verse 6, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. It reminds me so much about Jesus not opening his mouth. It's even kind of um, a self-proph- self-prophecy by James. He probably didn't know it, but they called him the righteous. The early church called him James the righteous or James the just. He was known for his righteousness. Um, they said when, he, when they finally stoned him to death, uh, I think under Nero, I believe, um, they finally stoned him to death and killed him for preaching the gospel, obviously, he, um, that many were upset, and this was like in the, in the 60s AD, this, this, it, things like that led to the whole revolt against Rome by the Jews, and eventually to Jerusalem getting overtaken and the temple coming down in 70 AD. But things like that, they were just like, you're killing this righteous man. And even believers and unbelievers, I read in church history that even they were all saying, I can't believe you killed this righteous man. Imagine being so righteous that everybody sees your righteousness. Um, it reminds me of what Jesus said, let your light shine so that people see your good works and glorify your God, your Father in heaven. And, and that's how we're to live, right? Let our, li- our, our light shine so much that people see our righteousness. They see our godliness. Is it for our go- glory? No, it's to glorify our Father in heaven. That's the only way they're going to know. They're gonna, we're going to be like a, a Bible. The only Bible that they read is going to be us, right? The only words they hear are going to be the words that Jesus gives us, and that's what they're going to hear. And, and, and our actions and our dealings, our business dealings, everything we do, it, it's going to be that light shining in a dark world. And we're going to hope that they give glory to God, that they, that they glorify the Father in heaven, ultimately become children of God and get saved. And that's, that's what we're doing for us. So it's not just for us, for our kudos. It's to save souls, to save souls. So it's worth it. It's worth it. And get more people in the kingdom, amen? So uh, verse 7 and 8 here. Once again, he says, Therefore, be patient, brethren. Just reminder that he's talking to the brethren. Um, like I said, there's some dispute on who he's talking to, when he's talking to it. Is it just here now he's talking? Was it a digression before? He was talking to the world. I believe since chapter 1, he's been talking to the church. Therefore, be patient, brethren. That's something that, that's huge for me is I need to be patient. Like I need that written over my, my bed, over my desk, in my restroom, everywhere, patience, because that's something that I lack and something that I need. Um, we talked about it on Monday with the men, and I think Brother Scott, I was like, you know, I used to say, I used to pray for patience, and people would laugh, but I never understood why they laughed. Scott said, probably because when you pray for patience, God's going to bring you trials, because that's the way patience is built, is through trials. So that made perfect sense to me. And it was like, I wish I would have asked some of the people who laughed at me when I said, I'm praying for patience. And they're like, ha, 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 you know. And I never stopped to ask, but Scott clarified that for me. And I used to hear that like 10 years ago, longer than people I'd been praying for patience. Like when I first got saved, I was praying for, for patience and patience. And um, God brought trials. And that, but that's how you grow. And we, we learned about trials and, and, and the disciplining of the Lord and, on, on Sunday. So here he's talking to his brethren, and he starts to ex- exhort them to endure trials. We already read in, in earlier in chapter 1 how we should count it all joy, those various trials, because they're supposed to produce endurance. Amen? So I just want to jump into First Peter. 
oops, too far. First Peter 1. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Amen? In this world, we'll have tribulation, but Jesus overcame the world. We live by faith, not by sight. It says here we haven't seen him, but we have that hope, that obtaining of our faith, the salvation of our souls, so we can go through those trials with that in mind, settled, completed in our mind, fixed in our mind, steadfastness, immovable, like it needs to be established in our mind, and that's what James, I believe, is trying to do here is settle this. Settle it in your mind. Establish this in your mind. This is what's going to carry you through trials. This is what's going to carry you through, through, through hard times. He says, be patient, brethren, because he had just told them about that judgment that was coming. They're gonna, God's going to judge. God's going to judge. But you, brethren, be patient. Like, don't take it into your own hands. And that's what could happen in these days. We hear, we've had brothers here talking about, like, I think that we should go back to what, you know, David used to do in his mighty men and just grab some swords and go out there and just start, you know, and it's like, that's not the sword we're supposed to be wielding. And we've heard that before, but I, the t- temptation is going to be there. It's going to be to take up arms and to go and, and, and fight against the establishment. That's going to be the temptation for a lot of us. But he's saying, no, you guys, be patient until the coming of the Lord. We still got time to go. The Lord's coming Back to that, how eschatological this is, this whole chapter here is, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord, as the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient and about it until it gets the early and late rains. The early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. It's nearer than it was then. It's nearer now. How much more important is this now? How much more? They would all even be familiar with, with, with about farmers and early right there in, 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 in Judea um, and how they got their early and late rains. Um, their early rains would have came like now, like in October, in October time in fall, and then their later rains would have came April, May, something like that. So um, just looking about, I'm not going to get too deep. I can't get too deep into the to early and later rains. That's, that's above my pray grade. We'll talk to Marco about more about the early and, and, and late rains, but early rains, like they germinate the seed. If you know anything about farming or planting, a lot of you do. The early rain, the rain will germinate the seed. You put a seed in, you give it that early rain, and God will provide that rain. And then it's going to rain. It rains throughout the winter season there. Rain, constantly rain, because you need water. You got to keep watering it, a little bit of water. You got to keep that soil. Sometimes you even have to amend the soil and add soil. If, if, you, know, if you know anything about growing, you got to make sure... Um, you got to make sure that no pests get in there and dig it out. I have dogs, so a couple times some dogs dug up my my potatoes that I planted. Um, they've dug up everything that I have actually. So I've, I've suffice to say, I didn't do too well this <laughs> last season. Um, so, anyways, um, but you have to keep it from pests, keep it from wild beasts. You have to. We have to be responsible for that thing. We have responsibility to keep this thing. But but the Lord is going to bring that rain. Rain in, in, in the Bible, according to John, according to Jesus himself, John in John 4 and John 7 represents the Holy Spirit, the water, that living water. So here we have that, that early rain, that, that Holy Spirit that comes into our life. And, and this is what, it's a, what it shows me, that we received the Holy Spirit when we became born again, when we gave our lives to the Lord. We received this Holy Spirit as little, little tiny seedlings on, on, on that good soil. But then we, started, we, had to, we had to walk in the Spirit, and we had to be taught by the Spirit. And he kept pouring that living water into us, and, and it caused us gro- to grow. It caused us to grow. And we had to be responsible to make sure we weren't letting any wild beasts come in and tear it up. We had to, come, we had to make sure that, that um, the soil was right. We had, to make, we had to maintain it. You know, if you're a farmer, you know you have to maintain it. You can't just throw it in the ground and just walk away and leave it. There's work that work needs to be done. Um, so we have responsibility. God sends rain. God provides everything. We have to, we have to uh, do it as well. We have responsibility. So receive the Holy Spirit. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to help us grow. And then we get that late rain. That late rain is when it's, it's going to ripen it. It's going to ripen that, that whatever it is, grain or whatever it is, and it's going to um, prepare it to be harvested. It's going to prepare it for the harvest. And 
that's what's going to happen with us. Right now, we're walking in the Spirit. We're being provided. And one day, Jesus will come, and, and he's going to come back. He's going to come for his harvest. He's going to come for us. The Lord is coming. He's near, it says here. He's near. And I see it like that. But he says, in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, he says, um, so that, like I said, the farmer knows how to be patient, and we too have to be patient, knowing that he's coming, he's near. Just keep doing it. You have the Holy Spirit. We have everything we need to live, to live a life, a crucified life, to overcome sin in our life, to grow in faith. We have everything we need. We have that rain. We had that early rain. We had that, that, that. We have, uh, we're equipped with the Holy Spirit. That's what we have. Be patient, because one day the harvester is coming. The harvester is coming. The Lord is near. So do not complain, brethren, he says. So meanwhile, you know, while we're traversing this land, meanwhile, he says in verse 9, do not complain, brethren, against one another. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door, like we read in Revelation earlier. The judge, Jesus, is standing at the door. And that's what he is. He's standing at the door. This is like a repeat also of of the previous chapter, in 11 and 12, he says, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against the brother or judges the brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So these are just warnings to us not to be complaining against each other, how important relationships are, one another are. Jesus taught this, that how important it is for us to love one another, and to have good relationships when we sin against each other, to come to each other, talk to each other about it, work it out. So important. And it's going to get even more important in the last days. We know we've been going through Hebrews. Do not forsake the fellowship. Do not forsake the fellowship, especially as you see that day drawing near. How important is it for us to have godly relationships? So he focuses in on this. This is the, the it's culminating here. To me, this chapter five in his letter here, it just keeps going and going and going. And it's like all the way to the very end. And it ends in chapter 5 with this right here, about about being patient, about judgment that's coming, about being patient, about continuing to love one another and not complaining against one another. Um, Adam complained against God, against his wife. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, and from the very beginning, he didn't cop up, right, to what he did, his responsibility. So that's what we need to do as well. We just can't pass the buck. We got to examine ourselves. We got to take the log out of our eye before we can take the speck out of someone else's eye. So we have to always keep that in mind, not complaining against one another. God's right there. He's right at the door. So is God right at the door? And I, I look at this as well as, as we know that he's knocking at the door. And has he been knocking at our door? We have to think about it. Like, has he been knocking at your door? The door of your heart, you know, the door in your mind. I don't know. Just is he knocking at you? Is he like, and are we like saying, no, I don't want to let you in. Like, I don't want to let you in. Not right now. And it's, that's something that we need to keep in mind, I believe, um, because if you let him in, he wants to come in and, and dine with you and be with you. So he says, meanwhile, you guys have patience. He goes, and then from there, he, he goes into um, the patience of the prophets in Job, who had incredible amounts of patience and endurance. The things that they went through, we're going through um, Jeremiah on Wednesdays. Pastor Mark has been going through Jeremiah, and we got, we've read so much about what Jeremiah went through, right? The weeping prophet all the difficulty, difficulties that he had. Um, in Jeremiah 7, 27, I won't go there, but I'll just uh, s- summarize it. The Lord gave him, the word of the Lord came to him, and he was supposed to go and, and speak God's words to, to a, a stiff-necked people. And he said, go speak these words to them. Go speak this, this, this call of repentance to them, but they're not going to listen. He says, and he said, go call on them but they won't answer you. And it's like, okay, like, why am I going to do it then? Isn't that how we feel sometimes? Then why am I going to do it? What's the point? They're not listening anyways. When we go places, people you guys have been witnessing to, your family members, your friends, your neighbors, you're just like, man, it feels like the, the busy signal's on, like talking to a wall. I hear that all the time. It's like I'm talking to a wall, just like Jeremiah. God's calling us to go and share with them, but here it is. We're like, why isn't this person getting saved already? You know how much I've talked to him. I've given him every reason why he should follow Jesus. I've said everything I could. I came at him this way. I came at him that way. Maybe you could do better. Can you talk to him? Can I, you know, we, we, we do that all the time. It's like, no, because they're, they're, they're blinded. They're deaf. And, and we need to pray 
we can't convince anyone. Nevertheless, we're called to go and share and speak. And, and, and it's so frustrating at times because it's like, like I said, it's like talking to a wall. And Jeremiah was up against that. But they put him in stocks. They sentenced him to death. They put him in a muddy pit. They, I mean, they ended up killing Jeremiah. They ended up killing Jeremiah along with many other prophets. Jesus told Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, you've killed the prophets. These men had so much patience because they did what God called them to do. They were faithful to what God called them to do, even though nobody listened. And it's frustrating sometimes when you go out there and, and we've been asked, why do, you, why do you go out to wherever you go to share the gospel? Nobody's listening. You know, and they're not listening. And all these people aren't getting saved. These other ministries that are sharing maybe, a, a, I don't want to say if it's a different gospel, but it's definitely half of the gospel, you know, a message of, of, of grace and love, and, and it stops there which is amen and yes and amen, it's true, but it doesn't get into God's justice and his righteousness and his holiness. It never brings up sin or repentance. So in these crusades or in these ministries, people are getting saved left and right. You know, people are giving their life to the Lord or according to their numbers because a lot of times it's about numbers. What were Jeremiah's numbers? What were Jeremiah's numbers? What were the prophet's numbers? I like to ask some of these people that, that have accused us of, 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 of not bearing fruit. So you were supposed to call them, but they wouldn't answer. We're called, we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be examples. We're called to be evangelists, you know, not preaching to many, but preaching to one, sharing with one, teaching our families. We're called to do all these things, um, and we need patience, we need extreme patience. Um, I forget where it's at, where it says, we haven't even resisted to the point of shedding blood. Was that in Hebrews? In Hebrews 12, we had just read it. Um, so it's like, when we're saying, man, they just, they're, they're calling me this, and they're calling me, wait a minute, you haven't even resisted to the point of shedding blood yet. These men actually resisted to the point of shedding blood. That was their patience, and it says that they were counted blessed. It says they were counted blessed. Doesn't it sound a lot like what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are you when people say all kinds of insult, when and people insult you and they say all kinds of lies about you when they persecute you. Blessed are you and great is your reward in heaven. Great was their reward in heaven, these prophets who died sharing the word of God. Blessed are them, James says here. Um, he goes on to say, oh boy. As an example, brethren, the suffering and patient, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings and that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. I don't have to go. Job has been taught to our elementary, our elementary kids. You guys know Job better than I do. You guys have been Christians for a lot longer than I have. You don't have to go into Job, or work, but you guys know Job. You guys know the, the patience of Job and the suffering of Job and what he went through. I just always want to bring this up. I think Pastor brought it up the other day, just something that Job had said, and you guys are familiar with it. He just says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Amen. Talk about faith. Talk about, talk, talk about walking by faith, living by faith, and having endurance and patience. Through all that, it says he still blessed the Lord. He still blessed the Lord, and he didn't resort to sin. He didn't resort to sin because of what, he was, what, what was taken from him. And like I was saying earlier, we might get things taken from him as these days are ahead of us, these years come ahead. We will. We will. We'll get things taken from us. But are we going to have that kind of attitude? And that's what James has been mostly considered in this whole letter is attitude, attitude of heart, right? Because that's where it starts. You know, it starts with the thought. It starts in the heart, and then it comes out of our mouth, whatever it is. Um, so he, James has been dealing with that. God always wants to deal with the heart. Amen? So we need to have that kind of attitude. It's like, oh, okay. Just let loose, you know? It's okay to have good things. It's okay to, to, to um, work hard for good things and nice things. It's okay to work hard to have um, that dream house. But just remember, it's a shanty compared to the mansion that's waiting for us in heaven no matter how nice it'll be. It's nothing compared to the matching that the Lord has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we have to hold those things loosely. Hold those things loosely because they can be taken just like that. Um, just like that, 
it could say zero, zero. And then we're like, then we're going to have to learn how to really trust the Lord to provide, provide for us. But what did Jesus say when the disciples told him? Um, we've given up. We've given up all these things, you know, for you, Lord. And Jesus is like, you guys haven't given up anything that you won't get back a hundred times, Jesus said. Amen. And it's true. People have taken advantage of that scripture and say, oh, see, just tithe and you're going to get back a hundred times. But it's like, no, Jesus is always more concerned with heavenly treasures. <laughs> He's always more concerned with heavenly treasures. So, and God does bless you on this earth as well. He does bless you. Remember it says, uh, it says, be rich in God as well. Be rich in God as well. That's the first, that's the first priority. So Jesus said that. He's compassionate and merciful. And, and you guys know the end of what happened with Job. God blessed him. Blessed him abundantly even more so because of that patience and that endurance. So it's worth it if we just stay patient and endure. Verse 12, but all, above all, brethren, I keep forgetting. I'm like, well, I'm going long, but we started real late. Just a reminder. Just a reminder, we started late. Verse 12. Yeah, sorry, brothers. But above all, my brethren, once again, my brethren, reminding them this is to us, it was to the Christian Jews at the time, it's to us now as well. My brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. How important is it, you guys, to have Christian integrity? I, I look at it as Christian integrity, and especially even more so in these last days, because like, we're going to have temptation, huge temptation to not have Christian integrity. And it's going to be dog eat dog, looking out for yourself, looking out for your family. Like we're just going to have to do what we have to do. It was in their time. They, were, they had temptations like that. We're going to have these greater temptations as well. And it's like, no, you, like, you know, don't just be a man of your word like James the righteous was. He was known as a righteous man. He was known as, it was Christ's righteousness. He had it. And, and God, if we've given God our sins, he's given us his righteousness. So we don't have to worry about being righteous. We just need to submit to God. He's righteous. He's righteous. Keep submitting to God. Stay humble before God, right? And he will draw near. Draw near to him. He will draw near to you. He said that in the previous chapter. So let your yes be yes. You shouldn't even have to make an oath. You shouldn't have to say, um, I swear to, you know what? You shouldn't have to say that. You shouldn't have to say, um, um, I put that on my kids' lives. You know, people say things like that. We made jokes about it the other day. What are some of the things we put it on? I put it on my, 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 my mother's grave. Yeah, someone said, I put it on my mother's grave. You know, we, don't have, we, shouldn't have to, <laughs> we shouldn't have to say those things, you know, because if we're known for our integrity, if we're known for our honesty and truthfulness as Christians before the world, they're saying, like, that guy is straight up. That guy right there, his word is bond. That guy, why? Why is he different than everybody else? Why is everybody trying to get over on the employer right here and, 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 and milk the clock or do this or do that? But that guy won't. Why is that? Why is his yes, yes, and his no's, no's? Because of, and you get that opportunity when you pray for the word to be opened, the door to be opened, because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. And it's getting closer to the, that judgment day. This is how I, it's more important for us. It's more important for us, you guys. Like, we need to, like, this is the mindset. This is what we need to settle in our hearts and our minds. Verse, chapter, verse uh, 3, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. He gets into prayer now. How important is prayer? Fervent prayer in the last days, it's, it's, it's essential. It, it's a command for us to pray and pray without ceasing, as Paul said. Is anyone among you suffering? It doesn't matter what we need to pray for. Not, I mean, it does matter, but here he, he points out a few things that we need to be praying when we're sick. He says, we need to, it's communication with God. We need to communicate with God when we're sick. We need to pray to God when we're sick. Um, when we're cheerful, we need to sing praises to God. It's communication to God. We need to sing praises to him. It's always just give it all to the Lord. Give glory to God. Pray to him when you're sick. You're, you're cheerful? Well, praise him, you know? Don't because things are going well, like Laodicea, you, know, you have no need of anything. Now I'm not going to, I'm going to step back a little bit. I'm not going to sing praises to God. And no way. Those are the times when you sing praises to God. Those are the times when you're like, whoa, can't believe how well I'm doing right now. I have more time to get into this right now. I could actually take a break and, and spend some time with the Lord today. Things like that. And that, those are the times when we we're supposed to be singing praises to him. Um, then he must call, those who are sick, must call the elders of the church, and they're able they're to pray over him. So a person who's sick should go tell the elders of the church so that they pray over him. That person should actually do that. A lot of times, like, we're just trying to, like, especially men, 
we got to like be like, come on, brother, just tell me what's going on. I know something's up, and we're, ah, everything's good. You know, I know I do that a lot. I'm good. You know, it's like, it takes a little more prying from somebody for me to like actually, okay, you know, it's like there's this that you need to pray for or whatever. I have a trouble with, with asking for prayer. Well, here, if you're sick, ask for prayer. You know, go and ask for prayer. They're supposed to ask for prayer, those that are sick, it says here. Um, and then there's a whole prescription for what's supposed to be done by the church of the elders to pray for them, anoint them with oil, um, more oil representation of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's pray that the Holy Spirit fills this sick person, no matter what if it is. Is it spiritual? Is it physical? Either way, the Holy Spirit will comfort this person. Maybe it's God's will. It's always with the disclaimer. I don't know if I could call it disclaimer, but it's always in God's will. We know that from prayer in, in the New Testament of how we're to pray. It's always in God's will. So it's like, it's not up to the person. If that person who's sick has enough faith, it says here, the prayer of those who are praying. So it's not up to the person that's been abused a lot of times. They say, well, you, you weren't healed because you just didn't have enough faith. Well, here it doesn't talk about the sick person's faith. It doesn't talk about them there. Here it talks about the faith of those who are praying, the prayer of faith, it says. Um, so you're calling them to pray for you, anoint them with oil. Either way, you're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to, to, to fill this person, give this person grace. As, as, um, as um, Paul said, it's your grace that's sufficient, even through things like that. And that's what ultimately we should pray. What if God doesn't heal you? Are you going to still have faith? Are you still going to, are you still going to trust in Jesus? Even if he doesn't, he didn't heal Paul's eyes. He didn't heal Timothy's illness. There's certain things that he just, just doesn't heal. Are you still going to have faith? Are you still going to continue? This could be a trial you're going through for your building up of, of endurance. Um, either way, you'll be filled with the Spirit and you'll rejoice always. Either way, even through these things, you guys know, you guys have been sick before. You know that even through those times, the Lord sustained you. The Lord got you through those things. He didn't just miraculously take that illness away. He used the doctors. He used treatments. He used medicines. Whatever it took, but he sustained you through those times and he got you closer to him and you learned something from through all those times. You learned something through that. That's by God, by people praying, by the Holy Spirit, God's goodness and his compassion and his mercy. Amen? Uh, let's see. So he talks about prayer here. He says, um, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and if the Lord will raise him up and he has, com has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. He ties sickness with sins, similar to the way Paul did in Corinthians. When those were, some of those were getting sick when they were taking the Lord's Supper in, 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 in an unworthy way, how closely sin is tied in with, with illness as well. And not always, as we know, not always. Um, Job, we just talked about Job. So this is a, something else. This is definitely, yes, there's sin that could definitely make us sick. And you guys have been there before. You know, when we fall, when we stumble, when we transgress, don't you feel sick? Don't you feel sick over it? You know, can that affect you? You know, we're, we're, we're mind and body, we're spirit and body. And it, it, it's intertwined, made in God's image. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. How much healing does it bring when you share? Uh, Pastor Marco reminded me that this is um, talking about weaknesses. Share your weaknesses with one another. Sometimes we think of it as like, I was, Catholic, I was brought up Catholic, so I thought of it as going to the confessional, going to sharing with another, a priest my sins. I did this, 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 and this. He said, okay, give, give, you did this, give me this many Our Fathers and Hail Marys for that many sins. You know, it's like, it was like that. But here it's talking more about confessing your weaknesses, your weaknesses with one another. How am I going to know what to pray for you if you don't share your weaknesses with me? If you don't share weaknesses with with um your spiritual brethren, your spiritual brethren, the leaders in the church, whoever it may be, another brother, it says here, um, or sister, share. Share your weaknesses. It says those sins will be forgiven. We know God is righteous and, and faithful. He forgives sins. We know that. Here it says to do that. Hard for me to do it. I need to pray more to, to actually you know talk to people and share with my weaknesses. I got a few, but it's like, it's hard. You know, it's hard to just share things, but... Everybody knows, even the world knows how much it, it, it's why they, they go to uh, psychologists and, and psychiatrists and they know what kind of healing that brings to you to just get it out. You know what I mean? Just get it out. But imagine how much so when you get it out and you get the Holy Spirit in. You get the Holy Spirit in, the healing, the, the healing comes in. Okay. The effectual prayer of a righteous man. The effectual, uh, the effectual prayer. Blah, blah, blah. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. This is a call for prayer and righteousness. 
Um, Because it's not just the prayer, it's the prayer of a righteous man. So it's a call for godliness as well. He says, speaking of a righteous man, he brings up Elijah here, like Elijah, who was a righteous man. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. For three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Um, First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. We can go there real quick. First Kings 17. Let's see. First Kings chapter 17. The prophet Elijah. And there was so much here, and I had said on Monday I was going to get in, but I'm running out of time. On Monday I said I was going to get into the more, to more details on this because there's just so much in here about Elijah and about the end times and about this three and a half years that's brought up, the last three and a half years before Jesus comes back, the last three and a half years of the age before Jesus comes back. Um, the spirit of Elijah is going to come back again. It already was here in John the Baptist. It's going to come back in some other way. Some people think it's one of the two witnesses. There's just so much so much, so, so much in here that Pastor Marco will share with you if he has a chance tonight. But in 1 Kings, I'll just go here. 1 Kings, I'm sharing because my dad did the awesome thing of sending me the exact scriptures that I needed from 1 Kings. If I could just find it. Oh, boy. Here it is. Oh, there it is. Interesting that, that it talks about suffering and how we must pray. And is anyone among you cheering? He's just seeing praises, how important prayer is when someone's sick, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And then it goes into Elijah, a righteous man. And, and his prayers availed much. He talks about the rain. But also in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17, It says, now it came after these things that the son of a woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said, Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. He said to her, give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom, carried him up to the upper room where he was living, and laid him on his own bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, you have also brought calamity to this widow with whom I am staying. My God... I'm sorry, by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he revived. Now, um, the, Lord, uh, the Lord gave Elijah a word and go and said, and go, go share this with Ahab and tell him that, that there's no rain. No rain's gonna come out. And so he prayed that no rain. Well, there's, with no rain, there's going to be a famine. And there was a famine on the land. There was a drought for three and a half years at the time. So through, and through this three and a half years, there's this drought. How is Elijah going to, be, is going to be provided for? Well, he says, go, I'm going to provide for you. Let me see if I have that in here. She says, he also says, I'm going to, so first he says, I'm going to go provide for you at this place. And the ravens are going to bring you food. They're going to bring food for you. I don't know if we read that earlier, but. This is, like, so awesome that Jesus talks about, like, don't even worry about even the ravens. Like, and he brings up ravens. Like, how much not to worry about these tough times that are coming. Even the ravens, God's going to use these miraculous things, like ravens, to feed Elijah. Like, when our bank accounts get frozen, when, when, when they take everything from us, when they're going to try to take everything from us, you know, they're already canceling us off the, the YouTube, things like that. When they do these things, when they take things from us, God's going to still supernaturally provide for us in ways we, don't even, we can't even imagine. But we need to trust him. And that's what it means to have patience. Is it means to trust him. To so trust him. That's, that's where our patience comes from. To trust in him. When we trust in him, he gives us strength. He gives us endurance when we trust him. And that's all it is. That's, that's all we, that's all he, Elijah trusted him and Elijah went. Um, in verse, uh, back in verse 1 of the same chapter, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was a settler of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely shall there be neither dew nor rain 
nor these years except my word. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook and I have commanded to the ravens to provide for you there. So we went and did according to the word and he went and lived by the brook of Cherith, which is the east of Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up and there there was no rain in the land. So then says, now I'm gonna provide to you through a widow. A widow who you just, you think of a widow, it's like, oh, the poor widow doesn't have anything. And she didn't, but God provided for both of them. He provided and he just, just kept providing through that t- tough times. So it was for three and a half years, it says, and there's so much in Revelation, you know, there's so much in Daniel that, we, that, that Pastor Marco can get into with you. But the last three and a half years before Jesus comes back, it's gonna be like this if we're still alive. It's gonna be like that. But even in those times, Jesus promised he's going to provide for us. He promises us. We just have to trust him. We just have to trust him. It's pretty awesome. Um, there's going to be mockers. Remember, Elijah was mocked. You baldy. And then what happened? The young, the young men or young boys whatever, were mocking him. You baldy. And, and two bears came out. Two ba- bears came out and mauled them and, and, and mauled these, these guys. And um, that's another representation of something else as well um, that I won't get into, the two bears. But... It's just so much there with Elijah, um, how he was mocked and how he was abused and how he had to run from Jezebel. And we learn in Revelation, Jezebel is like a picture of false religion. And in these days, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have all these things that we're speaking out against that we're trying to convince our family and friends that are in false religions. Like some of my family members are getting really old. I'm not going to say who, but they're getting really old and they're in false religion. And I'm trying so hard before they die. You guys, please. So this is what we're up against. We're up against this false religion, the spirit of Antichrist, this Jezebel spirit that's like, have, has our, our, our family members convinced, but we have to be willing to go to them and open our mouths. You know, even they already don't want anything to do with us. So what are we worried about? You know, it's like in love, in love, in love, we need to go to them and, 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 What are we willing to do? What are we willing to do? So he ends here with um, verse 18. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. The earth is producing its fruit right now. It's fruit in our lives, the behavior. We know them by their fruit. It's our behavior. The the rain is producing good fruit in us, but also it's going to produce the fruit of the earth. It's going to produce believers, believers that are going to be taken up at the harvest. They're going to be taken up at the harvest. So that's so important, why all this is so important, why the patience is important, why the prayer is important for that produce, for the earth to produce produce, more produce. I want more produce. I don't know about you guys. I want more fruit. I want more fruit in my life. I want to see more fruit by, by people being saved. I, it's, it's what I long for, to see my family members saved, um, willing to do whatever. The prophets, you got to be willing to, to, to die if necessary, it says. I'm going to end in verse 19 here. He says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth... My brethren, if any among you, it's like this is going to be real hard if, if, if you don't believe that, that brethren could stray from the truth. If you don't believe that, then it's going to be real hard to read this. You're going to have to start with the presupposition that you can't do this. So you're going to say, well, this isn't for us. But he says, my brethren, if any among you stray from the truth and one of you turns him back, let him know that he turns a sinner from the error of his way, save his soul from death, and will cover a multitude of sins. So a warning for all of us, don't stay, stray from the truth. But this is more than that, in my opinion. This is more than that. He ends here, in my opinion, he ends with love. In the way that his brother Jesus ended his earthly ministry with love, and he laid his life down for us. It was the greatest act of love that God gave. He laid his life down for us. And I believe James ends his book here with love because if you're willing to lay your life down for somebody right here and go after them, no matter whatever the cost, whether it's like the prophets, you're going after the lost because God told you to go after them, even though what happened to them, they suffered, they died, they were killed, I should say, Um, or like Job, to be faithful to God, he endured such hardship more than we could ever imagine. He endured. He was willing to go there. Um, Yes, the prophets, the endurance, the, the, the Job, uh, the farmer that has to wait. So he ends here with love. In 1 Peter, it says, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers. Christ's blood covers our sins. Christ's blood covers our sins. And that's what we're doing when we're saving somebody from death. It's talking about, it doesn't say just saving their physical body. It says saving their souls from death, their soul, from an eternal death. But 
Christ's love covers a multitude of sins. Christ's blood covers a multitude of sins. By you going out there and rescuing you and someone who strays, and that's, that's, that's our heart right there. That's what we should be willing to do. He ends, how important is it to go after somebody? How important is it for those that are, because what's coming, what do we know is going to happen before, before um, we get taken out of here? There's going to be the revealing of the lawless one, and there's going to be great apostasy. It's going to happen, and you guys have seen it happen before. You guys have had brothers and sisters. We've had brothers and sisters here that have fallen away, and we went after them. We went after them, but we still pray that, that for the destruction of their flesh, that one day it's enough that they turn around and repent and come back to the Lord, and that's what we hope ultimately is for the restoration of their souls, and that's what we hope and pray for. But are you willing to go? Are we willing to go? How far are you guys willing to go to save that which was lost? How far are we willing to go? The prophets were killed. They were killed, but now they're with the Lord. Job suffered great, great affliction, but he died an old man, it says at the end of Job. He died a real old man, and now he's with the Lord. Elijah was mocked, fled from Jezebel. He was depressed. He wanted to die at some point. He didn't think there was anybody left, but there was still 7,000. There was still a remnant. They were still there. And he got raptured. So whether we die, whether we're killed, whether we die of old age or whether we're raptured, we need to endure until the end. Amen? Amen. To live is Christ, to die is gain. God's calling us all to be like these great men. And they were just men, as James says here, with a nature like ours. But they faithfully served a mighty and powerful God. God wants us to be his mouthpiece now and until the end. He wants us to share the the good news, no matter the cost. I know it seems like an impossible task, but it was an impossible task then. They said they won't listen. They won't answer you. But remember who we serve and how big our God is. He's an amazing God. Amen? He's an amazing God. And it seems impossible sometimes, you guys. It just seems impossible. Like nobody's going to hear. No one's going to get saved. No one, it just, it's not going to happen. Even me, it just seems impossible for me to even go to the next level in my faith. It just seems impossible. We all know, you guys, that God said all things are possible in his word. All things are possible with God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name to give you thanks and praise, to give you glory tonight, Lord God. Everything we say and everything we do, Lord God, everything we have, Lord God, is yours, Lord. So help us to be good stewards, Lord God, of our time, of our finances, of of our bodies, Help us to store treasures in heaven with you, Lord God. Help us to look forward to that day with patience, Lord God, building up our endurance, Lord God. Help us to be prepared, Lord God, and ready for your coming, Lord God, by loving one another and not complaining against one another, by going after those who fall away, Lord God, by doing everything we can, Lord God, to share your word despite the cost, Lord God. As these days get darker, Lord God, help us to be a light, a bright, shining light, Lord God, a beacon on the hill, Lord God. Bless my brothers with your, my brothers and sisters, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit tonight, Lord God. Fill them with your spirit, Lord. If need be, Lord, give them a fresh anointing of your spirit, Lord God, an unction of your spirit, Lord God, so we could do the things that you're calling us to do, Lord God. We bless you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his forgiveness. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you for him, Lord God. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 Right.